Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I am Megan Price, the Executive Director of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Everyone, I'm Maria. I'm a statistician at the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, and I'm also really excited to be with you all here today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us from whatever time zone you may be in. Uh, we're gonna talk about a few different things today. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. My job uh, is the easy part, I think. I get to tell you a little bit more about our organization and the work that we do. And then I'm gonna hand things off to my colleague, Maria, who is going to talk about the data processing principles that our team relies on and then introduce this missing perpetrator problem and walk us through some statistical models to impute missing perpetrators and then wrap things up. Uh, I'll pause here for just a minute with a bit of housekeeping. I honestly don't know yet exactly how the logistics are gonna work, but I, I do believe we're gonna be able to do Q and A at the end of the talk. So if you do have questions coming up throughout the workshop, feel free to shoot those out as they come up on uh, as best as I can. I will try and manage those and sort of organize them at the end. Um, and Maria and I will also put up at the end a way to contact us. So we're happy to take some of those conversations offline if we don't have a chance to get to all of your questions today. So if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, I am the executive director of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, or HRDAG. And we are a nonprofit based in Northern California. We are a team of data scientists who partner with human rights advocacy organizations. And essentially what we do is we work with our partners to identify key questions of fact that can be answered through quantitative analysis. Historically, that's been through studying mass violence in international conflict. More recently, we've been looking at incidents of police violence and efforts to reform the criminal justice system in the US. But regardless of the specific context, our partners bring field and subject matter expertise. We bring scientific expertise. And ideally, we bring those things together to leverage the most possible advancement of an argument or answering a question that helps our partners' advocacy efforts. And speaking of partners, going to the next slide, over the last 30 years that we've been doing this work, we've been very fortunate to partner with a wide variety of organizations, everything from large international institutions like the United Nations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, to small local organizations in the countries we're working in. But regardless of the size of the partner, um, we always rely on them to identify that substantive question that's going to matter to their work. And I always like to start our talks with this quote from our colleague and co-founder, Dr. Patrick Ball, human rights stories tell about the worst events that anyone can experience. Taking responsibility for human rights information means assuming an obligation to the witness, to the families, and to the victim. We are morally obligated to do the best work that's technically possible so that the victim's story is heard and believed. To do otherwise disrespects the victim's suffering. And that is what all of our work is grounded in. We are a team of scientists. We do get down into the weeds, debugging a bit of code, solving a particular math problem. But we always remember that the reason why we're focused on those details is because we have this moral obligation to do the best work that's technically possible so that the stories that have been shared with us are confirmed and amplified. And I think one of the best ways to show that is just with a quick example from a court case. This is Dr. Patrick Ball on the right testifying against General Efrain Rios Montt who was the de facto president of Guatemala in the early 1980s, and he was charged with committing acts of genocide. And the statistical analysis that we presented in this case essentially showed that the patterns of violence were consistent with violence that was targeted against the Mayan population. The patterns of violence were consistent with acts of genocide. Now, as in any court case, there were multiple different ways that the lawyers tried to make this argument, but the one piece of the puzzle that we brought was this statistical analysis. And in the judge's guilty verdict, they specifically cited our analysis 
um, if you'll go to the next slide, and said that it confirms in numerical form what the victim said. And that is what we're always trying to achieve, an analysis that affirms and amplifies the stories that have been shared with us. So that very quickly is the context in which we all work and the stakes that we take on when we take on this work. And now I'm going to hand it off to Maria who will get down into those technical weeds and talk about why we rely on such a principled set of data processing guidelines um, and then get into a specific missing data problem. Thanks, Pankit. Um, and I think it's prudent to kind of start with, now that we understand the, the context and the background of HRDAG's work, the, the core principles that guide what we do. Um, so there are four of them. Uh, they're transparency, auditability, scalability, and reproducibility. And every single technical decision is guided by one or more of these principles. Um, so transparency means that our code is easy to understand, both now when we're writing it and in the future. Um, so I remember one of my very first days at HRDAG, I had gone back and looked at code from about a decade before then. Um, and I was able to read it, I was able to execute it, and I could easily understand what was going on in every piece. Um, by auditability, we mean that um, we've codified everything. So we've written everything that we've done down. Um, there's no kind of magic. You don't pull anything out of a hat. Everything is in a script somewhere or a file. Um, and there are no surprises. And you can test that code. So there are certs everywhere, or you can just run the code and see if it you know, did what you expected it to do or not. Scalability, uh, data doesn't always all come in at once. So when we start a project, we might not always have all the data that we'll eventually use. So we try to build a pipeline that uh, easily accommodates changes. So if more data becomes available, we can adapt our pipeline relatively easily to include that new data. And finally, and, and this one is, I think, often talked about more than the others, but reproducibility is important. Um, someone should be able to rerun our analysis from start to finish and get the same results on a computer with the proper setup. Uh, so by the proper setup, we use a lot of open source software, and I'll talk a little bit about this. So that just means they have the right packages installed. Their you know, path is they're set correctly, and they just run the code in the same order that we did. Um, so those four principles guide pretty much everything we do. And in order to kind of execute on these four principles, um, we divide our, our work into what we call tasks. Um, this is one of my favorite blog posts. It's written by our colleague, Patrick Ball. Uh, you should definitely read it. Um, I learn something new every time I read it. Um, but tasks are small, self-contained, and self-documented uh, kind of pieces of analyses. Um, they're structured in a very specific way. I'm not going to go into that too much today. Uh, you can learn more about that in the blog post. But that structure, and it's a lot of structure, is um, motivated by these four principles that we care about, transparency, auditability, scalability, and reproducibility. And any project we work on is simply a series of tasks joined together. Uh, that makes it sound like all the analyses are simple, and, and they're not, but we can rely on this structure, and it's the same across any project. So um, I can, uh, sorry, I want to go here for a second. I can go to any different project and the tasks might have different names and they might be in different orders, but they always look the same way. Um, and this helps me kind of uh, find myself if I'm exploring new code or studying something that maybe I did in another project. It's very easy to orient myself because everything takes the same structure. There aren't really a lot of um, surprises. Um, so we might have a question, you know, why do we need so much structure? You told me about your values, but not necessarily why so much structure. Um, so I, I think of three kind of high level problems we can avoid when we have structure. Uh, so first, it's really easy to forget what we've done. Um, if you don't write something down, you might not remember it. Uh, so if we put everything in code and put it where we will know to look for it in the future, it's very easy to not forget what we've done. Um, it's hard to read each other's code. Um, so this is especially uh, important when you're working on a solo project, I think. Uh, because even though you might think you're working alone, really, it is a collaboration with you today and you in six months. And those two people might be very different people and might have very different ideas about how code should look and work. Uh, when you have this common structure, it makes it a lot easier to read what you have done in the past. Um, also to read what other people do, but I think more commonly we get into the trap when we work alone. 
And then finally, uh, when we break things up into these small little tasks that are self-contained and self-documenting, it's a lot easier to test that something is working correctly and to isolate where a bug is occurring when something is going wrong. Um, so if you're thinking whether or not you need this, there's a sort of more than, two, uh, more than two's rule that we think about. So do you have more than two analysts working together? Uh, will the analysis be used in more than two reports? Are there more than two data sets? Are there more than two programming languages? Will the project last more than two years? If the answer to any of these questions is yes, then maybe you'll benefit from more structure. And if the answer to all of them is no, maybe not. Um, I tend to actually structure every single project this way, uh, regardless if I've met the more than two, twos rule. And it, you know, is very helpful for me and I really enjoy it. Um, I'll skip through that. And then just to kind of ground these kind of abstract ideas into some more concrete a more concrete set of tools. I'd like to tell you a little bit about some tools that I use. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, these are just some things I kind of use in my day to day uh, that I think are useful for illustrating these. So first is version control. Um, this is really great for collaboration. So I use Git and GitHub. Uh, HRDAG loves open, uh, open source software. Uh, R and Python and Bash are main staples, but Julia and Stan uh, also show up a lot. We like open file types, uh, CSVs, TXTs, and uh, I've been using Feather and Parquet files a lot, in particular because when using different programming languages, uh, Feather and Parquet, so like R and Python, for example, um, are easily interoperable. So I can write a file in R and feel confident that Python will be able to open it without kind of, for example, recoding missing values as text or something like that. Uh, make files, so make files are the main way we uh, kind of string different tasks together and also that we ensure code is executed in the proper order. And then finally, uh, in addition to writing code, there's also a lot of writing prose. And our markdown files make it really easy to integrate both code and prose together and to generate reports that you don't have to go and find a number and change every single time your analysis changes. Uh, that's actually my favorite part of our markdown files, is not needing to find those uh, pesky little numbers and change them. Um, yeah, so now that I've told you a little bit about kind of this toolkit looming in the background, I'd like to introduce kind of the star of the show, this perpetrator imputation question, tell you a little bit about what it is, and then go into the statistical models kind of involved a little bit more. Um, so a big picture of the problem is we have a data set of human rights abuses, and some of the observations are missing information on the institutional perpetrator. So all of these are abuses where there is a perpetrator, none of them are perpetratorless abuses. Uh, some of them are missing and some of them are not. So our goal in doing this imputation is we'd like to predict the missing institutional perpetrator or perpetrators from a predefined list of potential perpetrators. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit um, a little bit more about the data we receive from our partners. So we have multiple files. They are information about victims, the abuses, and then various crosswalks to kind of join victims and events data. The data is a mixture of kind of categorical data, continuous data. And then there's this very important free text narrative that describes the abuse where parts of that narrative have been coded and then other parts have not been. Uh, not all the columns are standardized or clean and there is missing data everywhere. Uh, so not just in this perpetrator column that we're interested in imputing, but I mean, all of the columns are missing lots of data. None of the columns are clean. And uh, it's not always clear, even though there are these crosswalks, how all of the, thing, the pieces fit together. Uh, so when I first uh, kind of started working on this program, uh, this problem, I felt like this dog in uh, this ca great Casey Green comic, and I thought I was in a room on fire. It was really overwhelming. I didn't really know where to start. I hadn't collected the data myself, so I didn't know all the kind of ins and outs of the data. Um, and I sat there for a little while and felt confused and very overwhelmed. Um, but then I remembered that I have this great set of tools that I can uh, work with and kind of start working on this problem. Uh, so I'm a very visual person. So naturally this meant uh, drawing a diagram and dividing my kind of ambiguous, difficult uh, problem into a set of concrete actionable um, steps. Um, so just to walk you through kind of the big picture, what's going on. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import the data set. So this involved kind of reading the files, they were Excel files, so I, I read them all in. I figured out how the pieces joined together after a lot of back and forth um, with someone who told me how all the keys worked. Uh, so that was the first thing. And then I kind of cleaned and standardized some columns. So first step. 
The next step is kind of forked into two uh, because they're not related, so they can be done in parallel. One of that, one of those forks is I'm going to go and fill in all those missing variables that were not the perpetrator. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how I did that, but that's one step. And then the next step was that really important narrative field to try and take some more meaning out of it. So there were too many records to kind of review all the narrative fields manually. So what I did instead is I fit some topic models to try and take out some of the meaning. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more. Then we joined all those features together. So my newly in, uh, imputed model covariates, my topic models, just kind of squish those all back together. Then I imputed the missing perpetrators, and then I just assessed my model to make sure it fit. So from all the, the chaos I was feeling, I got this neat little diagram and a set of tasks. Um, I flashed this before, but this at the end of the project is what my uh, repository looked like. Very familiar structure. Um, and everything fit together via make files. Uh, and then there's this additional write task, and that was just kind of writing up the results. And then afterwards, I was maybe still in my room on fire. I still had a lot of work to do, but I felt better. Everything was fine. Uh, this isn't to say now that like magically there were no further complications in doing this project. In fact, there were many bugs, many hours spent Googling things that were not immediately clear to me. But I had this kind of overarching structure, so I didn't feel like I was wallowing in an abyss. I felt like I knew where I was going, and I, then I needed to just work out the details. Uh, and I'm telling you all this just so you know, uh, I feel like sometimes I think that projects are going to go so smoothly from start to finish, but uh, they don't always. But I had this structure to lean on, and that helped a lot. Um, OK, so now that we kind of know where we're going, so we have the big picture ironed out, I like to highlight three different uh, sets of statistical models I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the mist forest algorithm uh, and imputing uh, variables and the mist forest algorithm, which is the algorithm we used. Then I'll go on and talk about topic models. Um, and I'll talk about non-negative matrix, matrix factorization and latent Dirichlet allocation, two different topic models. And then finally, I'm going to spend the most time talking about the actual imputation of the missing perpetrators. This is really where we get our results. Um, and I'll, there I'll talk about multi-label classification. OK, so first, imputing missing variables. Uh, so I, I kind of mentioned before that many records had missing information in fields that we care about. Um, so these are mostly kind of demographic fields. So they could be information about the victim, like their sex, their age. Um, the location or date of the violation. There might be some other kind of um, information about the person, maybe whether they were trade unionist or um, what type of weapon that was used in the violation. Uh, the problem here is that many statistical machine learning models don't handle missing as well. Um, so sometimes if you just feed your data into a model without or into an algorithm without doing anything about the missingness, uh, the model might either drop records where something is missing or just drop entire columns where any missing data is present. Um, neither of these are ideal, um, especially in terms of dropping rows. You could imagine that perhaps a row that is missing some data might be somehow meaningfully different than a row that is not missing some data. And then still others require that the missing data all be treated the same way. So if, you know, we have a column like age and say age is, you know, years, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, it might require that all of the NAs be treated as, you know, some year where the year is just NA. Um, that might not be ideal either, um, but we can fill these in. Imputation methods exist, and we should use them. Um, so, and we do this before we impute the perpetrators so that we can then use this information to help us impute the perpetrators. Um, there are lots of different ways to do imputation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the mist forest algorithm, which is based on random forests. Um, and yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, so let me tell you why I picked Miss Forest. Uh, there are plenty of imputation methods out there. Why this strange one that you've never heard of before, perhaps? Um, so the first important thing for us in this problem is that it handles both continuous and categorical variables. Um, there are several different uh, imputation methods that handle only one of those, but I had two different types of missing data. So I wanted to deal with both of those simultaneously. The second important thing that makes me really like Ms. Forest is that it's, ro it's rather robust to noisy variables or multicollinearity. Um, so random forests do built-in variable selection. So if you have, say, two variables that tell you very uh, similar things, so say 
in numeric age and age category. Um, those are correlated. Uh, if your age is maybe below 18, you're going to be considered a child or above 18 an adult, perhaps. Those will be very correlated, but random forests know how to work with that um, and they don't skew the results. Another thing that's really great is that the data doesn't need to be scaled or standardized. It doesn't matter what unit you're using. It doesn't matter what the variance is or the distribution of the data. You can use Miss Forest right out of the box. And then in terms of performance, this benchmarks better than median or mode imputation. So median imp imputation for categorical or continuous variables and mode imputation for categorical variables and KNN, which are K nearest neighbors, which is often used as a kind of more complicated form of imputation, but that comes at a cost in that this can be very computationally uh, intensive. So we had a kind of larger data set with about 300,000 rows. So this did mean setting up the code to just run for a few hours. I think it ran for two or three hours and I just set it up to run and did not expect it to be done anytime soon. And that was fine for my purposes, but that's an important uh, consideration to make when you're choosing an imputation algorithm. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the algorithm at a very high level. Um, so, the first step of the algorithm is we're going to fill in any of the missing values, so any column with missing values, uh, using median imputation if we're a continuous variable or mode imputation if that's a categorical variable. Uh, and by median imputation, I mean I'm just going to fill in the column's median value and by mode, the column's most common value. And that's just an initial guess. Um, I'm also going to kind of take note of where the missing values were and not forget that. The second thing I'll do is I'm going to sort the columns from the column with the least missingness to the most missingness. So if nothing is missing, the column will be on the left. And if you know every value is missing or most values are missing, it will be on the right. Then for each of these columns, I'm going to iterate through these columns in order. I'm going to fit a random forest model on the non-missing rows using all of the other variables. So all of the variables that come after it, if it's our first kind of pass at this, this will use the kind of guesses uh, to fit that model. Then what I'll do is I'm going to predict the missing values for this first column, say, using that random forest model, and I'm going to update the data frame with my predictions. Then I'll go to the second column, and I will use all of the other columns to fit the, man, uh, the random forest model for these missing rows, predict the missing values, update the data frame. And I'm going to do that for every single column that there's missingness. Um, so we keep updating these values for the missing column. And then we're going to repeat doing iterating over every single column until we meet some stopping criteria. Um, so this might be, OK, we're going to stop after we've iterated through every column 10 times, after you know we've noticed that the change in the values has changed very little from one step to another or some other uh, stopping criteria. And then once you get there, you stop and you say, OK, this final data set is the data set. That's it. I've imputed the missing values. The result of this is now what we will consider as an input a little bit later to our um, perpetrator imputation model. So this is step one. So we've now imputed these kind of covariates. So we're part of the way there. And then the next thing I did after this is I went and tackled that narrative field. There was nothing to impute on the narrative field, so we had to do something else. Um, and there was also no kind of keyword searching to be done to uh, get all of the possible meaning out of it. Um, so we had about 300,000 records, and pretty much all of them had these kind of free text narratives. Um, this was too many to review manually, and we weren't going to be able to solve our missing perpetrator problem by using something like a keyword search in the narrative field. Um, so we had to think of some, you know, statistical model to help us extract some information, and we landed on topic models. Uh, so topic models, models, their goal is to uncover some underlying semantic structure of the narratives. Um, and what they tell us is about sets of words that frequently occur together. So it's not necessarily that they tell us, like, this underlying themes in the narrative, but rather... What is often interpreted as themes is just, these are the words that often appear together. They can have a coherent you know, meaning to you, a coherent kind of subjective interpretation or not, but they do commonly occur together. So our kind of theory of why we were doing this, uh, and this is another computationally intensive operation. So again, you have to weigh the cost of doing this computation with the benefit. But our thought about the benefit is maybe there was some sort of underlying semantic structure 
that might provide useful information about the perpetrators that were missing. Maybe these perpetrators, even though they weren't named by name, there was some sort of commonality in how they were written about in these narrative fields. Uh, so one of the things that we noticed is that these narrative fields were sort of an in-between length in terms of the types of data that topic models are usually trained on. So we decided to fit two different types of topic models. So the first model we fit were, was a non-negative matrix factorization model. So these have been benchmarked better for shorter text. So think something on the size of a tweet. And then latent Dirichlet allocation, better for longer text. Think maybe an article or a book. And then we generated 25 different topics from each of these um, methods for each narrative. And by 25 topics, I mean, I said, give me, you know, 25 different groups of words that commonly co-occur together in these narratives. And then what we did is we used these resulting scores as inputs to the perpetrator imputation model. So basically what we get for each record is we have a column that say, latent Dirichlet allocation uh, topic one. And there are scores for that topic. And they tell you something about how present that particular topic was in the text. And the theory is that narratives that are similar in their underlying semantic structure will share topics. And then along with sharing topics, they will share them in kind of similar proportions, if you will. So if we have narrative A and narrative B, um, we might divide. Narrative A might relate to three of these topics with some weighting. If narrative B were similar, it would also pertain to those same three topics and it would have a kind of a similar weighting distribution. Um, so these are now numeric representations of the text that we can go and plug into a model. They are no longer this kind of gigantic free text field that we're not sure what to do with. Um, so we have, again, some new features to go into our model. And now, we get to the actual imputation. So now I have all of my covariates. I've now joined them all together. So now each uh, record, which is a human rights abuse, has all of the kind of variables about the victim, the event, where it took place and whatnot. It now has this numeric information, this numeric representation of the narrative field. And every row now has all of this data. So I have these about 300,000 records total. So about 100,000 of them are missing perpetrator information. So we can consider our kind of training and, and validation data to be those 200,000 records that, you know, on top of having all of these features, have the perpetrators documented. And I'll remind you that each violation can be attributable to zero, one, or more of the institutional perpetrators we've identified. And any combination of perpetrators is possible. So we haven't we haven't said, oh, it can either be this or this or this. Any combination of the different institutional perpetrators is possible. And our goal is now to build a classification model to predict the missing perpetrator or perpetrators. I'm going to talk about um, multi-label classification, and it's going to be using a series of binary classifiers. I'll get to this a little bit in a moment, um, but I'm just saying this out loud because there are many different ways to do multi-label classification. This is certainly not the only way to do it but this is the way that we considered it for this project. Uh, and I'm going to pause and talk about multi-class classification versus multi-label classification. Um, and I usually do this because they sound very similar, but they're actually different and it usually confuses me. So I figured it's worth pausing for a second and talking about. So multi-class classification, we have some model covariates X. So these are you know, characteristics about the victim, uh, characteristics about the human rights abuse, uh, topics from the topic model, and we have a single outcome Y. So there would be one perpetrator, but that one perpetrator could be from three or more classes. So it could be perpetrator one, perpetrator two, perpetrator three. So not binary classification, but trinary classification, or I don't know what comes after that, but more than two. Uh, but there's only one of them. It could only be one institutional perpetrator. So if I had observed the data and saw, oh, you know, of the observations where perpetrator is recorded, there's only ever one perpetrator written down. I might have considered multi-class model, but there were not. There were these multiple perpetrators. So that leads us to the multi-label classification. So again, we have a similar setup. We have the same model covariates, but instead of having a single outcome Y, we have now multiple outcomes Y1, Y2, up to Yn, where each of those subscripts refers to one of those institutional perpetrators. And now our goal is to predict 
which of two or more classes an observation belongs to. We have no constraints on the number of classes an observation is assigned to. So an observation can absolutely only be assigned to one of the perpetrators, but it can also be assigned to two of the perpetrators, three of the perpetrators, all end up the perpetrators. Um, and for reasons I will hopefully demonstrate in a little while, this can also sometimes be referred to as chained classification. We're going to chain several different binary classifiers together, telling us whether or not a perpetrator was present. Um, to you know, give us some information about what we should impute. Um, and I'm a very graphical person, so graphically, uh, the two are a little different. So on the left, we have multi-class classification, where each of our samples represented by the squares can belong to one and exactly one of the perpetrators. On the right, for the multi-label class, we can have kind of any combination of things. So we can have two perpetrators, one perpetrator, all three perpetrators, it doesn't really matter. Uh, anything is possible there, but that is the way that those two are different. Uh, so now going to multi, now I'm going to focus exclusively on multi-label classification now that uh, we've kind of reminded ourselves that these are two different things. Um, so a graphical representation of what's going on is here. Again, our covariates are X, we have these victim characteristics, we have date, we have place, and we have narrative topics. And then we have all of these Y columns, one for each and every one of our perpetrators. And to make this a little bit more concrete, I'm going to walk through how this classifier works with three perpetrators, Y1, Y2, and Y3. So the way this works is that we're going to start with our covariates X. And the first thing we're going to uh, predict is Y1. So I'm going to use my covariates X to get my predictions for perpetrator 1. I fit my model, uh, I use my you know, label data to train my model, and now I'm fitting it on my, um, my observations that are missing perpetrator information. And after I fit this model, I get some score between zero and one for whether or not perpetrator one, the model predicts that perpetrator one was involved. Okay, so now I have X and this column full, full of numbers between zero and one inclusive for Y1. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my covariates X and my predicted values for Y1 and use those as the inputs to predict perpetrator 2. So predict, predict the values for Y2. Again, I get some score between 0 and 1 inclusive for perpetrator 2. And now I add that column to my data frame. And finally, because I only have three perpetrators in this example, I take the covariates X, the predictions for Y1, the predictions for perpetrator one and the predictions for perpetrator two in column Y2, and I predict perpetrator three in Y3. So in the end of doing all this, I have my same covariates I started with and these three columns that now have the scores. And I'm going to now repeat, but I'm going to randomly reorder the columns. So now instead of having perpetrator Y1, Y2, and Y3 like I did last time, now I'm going to have perpetrator Y3 followed by perpetrator Y2 followed by perpetrator Y1. And the reason I do this is so that we don't kind of um, only pick up on the ordering of the perpetrators. Um, so I don't wanna learn a dependency based on the way that the, the order that we predicted the perpetrators in. So I'm going to repeat this and now I'm going to reorder it. So again, walking through this, I'll use the covariates X, we'll predict perpetrator three. Get my scores, use those scores along with the covariates to predict perpetrator two, and then use those scores from both perpetrator two and perpetrator three, along with the covariates to get perpetrator one scores. Now again, I have this data frame at the end, I have all these different scores for all my different perpetrators, and I'm going to repeat and randomly reorder another time, starting with Y3 again, but then I will go to Y1 and Y2. Same story, I end up getting scores. Uh, and I'm going to repeat this many times. Uh, with only three perpetrators, I would probably do this exhaustively. So I would test every single different uh, ordering of the perpetrators, and I would just fit every model and get every predicted score. If you had, you know, say 10 perpetrators and didn't have the computational ability to do all of those combinations, I would pick some random sample of the some you know large random sample of the combinations, fit all those models, and then call it a day. But now we have you know each observation now has multiple sets of scores associated with it. So to get our final uh, results that we will then use to impute the perpetrator, what we do is we average. 
So for each observation, I'm going to collect all of the scores that correspond with it. So for these runs I just did, that means each observation has, say, three different sets of scores for every perpetrator. So what I do to get my kind of final score for each perpetrator is I'm going to average the results. You might also take the median of the results, but you can average the results, and that becomes your final score. Uh, and then you can use these scores in different ways. You could do a typical threshold and say, okay, if the score is above 0.5 for this perpetrator, I'm going to declare they were present. And if it was below 0.5, it will declare they were absent. You could do that. You could also do uh, another kind of random game where you say, okay, I have my average score now. I'm going to pick a random number and I'm going to ask how many times is it higher than this random number and how many times is it lower? Um, and then you can kind of get a distribution of how often you think that you should impute that record as belonging to that perpetrator, and that helps you visualize uncertainty. Um, and then this helps you ask que answer questions like, what fraction of the records that are missing a perpetrator are likely attributable to perpetrator I? Uh, so all of this is kind of getting us towards more substantive questions. It's not merely descriptive. Um, but yeah, um, so that's what I have for you today about kind of the principles and methods that went into this multiple imputation problem. Um, things we reviewed today, uh, we talked about principal data processing and some of the tools involved. Um, I reviewed this missing perpetrator imputation problem, mainly as a way of exploring kind of these three different statistical models. So misforce for imputing missing model covariates, um, non-negative matrix factorization, and latent Dirichlet allocation for extracting information from our free text narratives, and then this multi-label classifier, which put everything together to help us impute the missing perpetrators. Um, my goal was really to explain process and methods rather than present um, specific results. And my hope is that you're able to take away something we talked about today and apply it to your own work, no matter what domain or specific questions you're working on. Um, that's all I have for now. So if there are questions, I think we can open it up, but I'll just put this slide uh, on first. Um, those are Megan and I's email addresses. Um, if you're interested in HRDAG's um, newsletter and want to stay up to date about our work, you can subscribe at hrdag.org slash subscribe. But yeah, um, thanks so much. And any and all questions would be welcome. And yeah. Thanks, Maria. Um, I haven't seen any come through. I don't know if we're going to be able to do the cross-platform transfer, um, but I have been keeping an eye on the chat just in case any of our behind-the-scenes friends popped any in there. Um, but I guess I could ask some questions, <laughs> which is that um, my understanding is that you, this was sort of like a pilot test. It was like, we think we could use this particular combination of models to answer this question. Oh, look, we can. Um, so how transferable, I mean, you closed by saying that you hope it applies in a variety of contexts that folks might be working in. So so what's your what's your sense of how transferable it is? Do you do you feel like there are, do you have sort of boundary conditions that you've already bumped into where you're like, oh, it doesn't work if this is what's happening or, this is the scenario where these models excel. Yeah, so um, we had kind of, there are two different versions of this project, two different trials of it. So one of them was on this larger data set, and that's what I talked about today, this data set of 3,000 um, observations, where we had about two thirds without missing perpetrator information, and then one third that was missing perpetrator information. We tried doing the same exact pipeline, a slightly different implementation, but same exact pipeline, on a much smaller data set. So more on the order of 2000, where um, I think about half were missing and it really didn't work well. We weren't able to take a lot of um, useful information out of the um, kind of topic models in part, I think, because the narratives just weren't as rich. But the other place that we really struggled in that case was there were, I think, five different perpetrators, um, but the model was just not able to distinguish kind of at all between any of them. Um, so I think in general, I think the imputation works fine on small data sets, but definitely the combination of the narratives with these kind of sparser, uh, or rather the topic models with the sparser narratives, and then not having a lot of training data for the actual imputation model for the perpetrator uh, made it really difficult for us to get any sort of uh, meaningful or, or helpful results out of that.
Gotcha. Thanks. And then you also mentioned that you tried two different topic models, topic modeling approaches since the narrative lengths were kind of in between. It sounded like you just like you kept the topics from both approaches. Did did you get a sense that one worked better than the other or was it really richer to have both? It was actually really richer to have both. Um, so that was one of the really reassuring things when we did. I didn't talk a lot about model assessment, but one of the things we looked at at the end um, was variable importances. Uh, so if you fit a tree-based model, you can look and see the relative importances of the various variables you included. And um, what I did is I looked at the top 10, um, so the 10 most useful variables, and they ended up pretty much across the board for any of the perpetrators being a mixture of both the latent Dirichlet allocation and the non-negative matrix factorization topics, along with some of those kind of more um, fields, either about the location was a popular one and also year, there was a temporal element too. Um, so those came up a lot. And that was really reassuring because one thing we worried about in the beginning was, oh, are the perpetrators overdetermined? When And when I say that, I mean, if does the presence of one perpetrator perfectly predict either the presence or absence of another? Or does the absence of one perpetrator perfectly predict either the presence or absence of another? So it was really reassuring in the end to see, no, that wasn't the case with the perpetrators. And then yes, all of that computational effort we put into both different types of topic models really seemed to have brought richness to the model that was not necessarily present in those other fields, be they victim characteristics, the, the date of the violation or the place of the violation. So I was glad I did both. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. I have to admit that that was a very self-interested question because uh, for folks who are listening, I have a similar problem in a different project um, where I think my narratives might all be kind of more Twitter length. They're not tweets, but they might be kind of more that length, but I think they might actually be this in-between challenge as well. So I'm thinking through that um, with you on the fly, which is so useful, thank you. Um, so I know we have just a couple of minutes left, but is there anything else you wanna say about some of the model assessment, some of the sanity checks that you did? Yeah, um, so one thing that was great is we came in with, I would say like a substantive set of sanity checks that we cared about. Um, there's right, the technical aspects, does the model fit properly? Um, you know, have we overfit the model? Have we tuned our parameters properly? How do we work for that? But one thing that was really helpful was, you know, and the reason we partner with people rather than just, you know, making stuff up ourselves is because they come with this great substantive knowledge. Um, so prior to fitting these models, we had talked to our partners and, you know, we had decided, okay, this perpetrator uh, over determination uh, case would be kind of concerning to us um, because we don't really think that's necessarily a reflection of reality you know, what was on the ground, um, very different than um, what was maybe documented. But yeah, I would say actually an important aspect of the, um, the assessment was this substantive conversation that we had with our partners beforehand. So before we even really got to the modeling, it was, what should we be looking out for? You know, what do you know that you can teach us? Um, so yeah, subject area experts are awesome. And I love working with yeah. them. <laughs> Agreed. Um, so we do have a couple of questions um, in our last 60 seconds, so I'll just read this really quickly. When evaluating the final performance, if the model performance is not as expected, how will you know it's because the imputing algorithms didn't do well, or is it because there's something else wrong within the data? And does the misforest imputation work for new unseen test data? You might not be able to answer that in 30 seconds. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer all of that in 30 seconds, but um, we have a lot of confidence in the misforest algorithm based on its kind of benchmarking in the publication I, that I was referenced in the slides, as well as our kind of visual inspection. Uh, but I do think in that case where it didn't work well, it was just truly not having enough training data for the imputation model. Um, and I think everything would have been enriched a lot more had the data set been larger. Um, but yeah, our models can only be as good as our data is. And that's just it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I know there are a couple other email, uh, questions in email um, and I would say reach out to us and we're happy to talk about that offline. Thanks everybody.